Um, welcome everybody. Um, the next uh, hour and a half I will explain you a little bit um, about my path as a, an artist, uh, where I come from and uh, what I'm doing. And on the end, uh, I'm uh, more than free to, uh, to answer your questions. Um, I always love to, to start with this picture because as an artist, you always get like um, a branding. Um, I work a lot with the color of yellow, so suddenly you're the, like uh, the yellow artist or you're working with a computer, so people give you like the branding of a 3D print artist. But of course, I don't see myself as just a 3D print artist, but as an artist. And this is actually the, um, the, the studio, the workshop um, for my student time. And it's really important because I give like a lot of lectures to, to game students and they are all thinking of uh, software and computer. But my basic, my starting point is actually just working with uh, fiberglass, cardboard, um, with really cheap materials like styrofoam. And I think that's really important because that's a lesson that um, some people that are working with a computer um, don't have. Um, to explain a really little bit about my background, um, at the age of 15, I had the idea to, uh, to become an accountant, so my life uh, took a really different direction. And I started um, with studying um, architecture on the age of uh, 16. For me, it was really crazy because I, I love, as a child, to, to play with uh, the Lego cubes and, and build my own home. Um, but the idea of um, architecture um, lost a lot of its uh, romantic feeling. Because I think today, if an architect can be like 3 or 5% creative in his job, it's already much because you have all the, the technical uh, rules of the law, you have um, the mathematical law, uh, you have um, the financial laws you have to deal with. So really being creative is getting very difficult. Also at that time, um, architecture was not yet with uh, computers or not yet on school. So it were really still uh, drawing lessons, pen and paper, um, really boring sleeping perspective lessons. Um, but maybe I learned a lot in, uh, in the sleep. Um, I was already building like really huge models, but I did not have the knowledge of um, um, yeah, how to make them strong. So a lot of my models, they only exist like for one or two weeks and then they flunked in each other. So on an age of um, 16, 17, I went to um, study ceramic. Um, for me, ceramic is one of the most beautiful things. You can immediately put your hands in clay. You can immediately um, give a vision to your ID. It's such um, a freedom to, to work in clay. But at the same uh, time, it was really scary for me to say, I will now go to study uh, ceramics on an art school and, and do the rest of my life uh, ceramics. Um, I got a luck. Um, let's say I played with uh, the Lego cubes till um, an age of um, 14, 15, an age that you don't really are able to still say that you're playing with the Lego cubes. So I ended up in really um, a game addiction, but a game addiction then I really mean like um, a summer on an age of 15 was like getting up for 11 o'clock, uh, gaming till 4 o'clock in the night, and I, I don't think I saw the sun in a, in a summer as a child. I had uh, luckily parents that uh, left me a lot alone. Um, and at school suddenly we got like um, a little um, course like um, Photoshop, um, sort of um, InDesign, Quark Express at that time. And a whole new world uh, went open for me, suddenly realizing that you can do something other with a computer than just playing games. Of course, it's obvious, but as a child, you really didn't think about that. So I think the, the year next to that, I was already teaching on May 18 together with uh, the teacher because, because you know the code of a computer, you, they were not able to teach me anything uh, after one year. And I have a daughter of three and you already see, I give her my cell phone and she starts to play the games. She, she never um, learned anything, but it's like almost in their code. And of course, software is getting more and more uh, developed. So it's almost um, a logic that is the logic of uh, human mankind. And I think the best software is actually explaining itself uh, almost to you. So on my 18, I didn't want to, to decide. I wanted to, uh, to go to the arts in Ghent in Belgium. But um, painting was uh, too limited for me. Ceramics was too limited for me. Um, uh, sculpture was too limited. I really had like almost the idea of um, Leonardo da Vinci. I wanted to, to almost do everything. Of course, that was a big illusion because today we're in a world where everybody has really to, to specialize and we have so much information. 
but I found an education where I could study a little bit of uh, film photography and really start um, to develop um, my own stuff. But after two years, I'm, I didn't fit there and I changed to an education that is um, called um, mixed media. So I'm graduated in mixed media. This is a classroom of mixed media. We had uh, the luck to have really a big space. We had uh, one old computer and we had um, some small machines, a drilling machine, and that was about it, I think. So I didn't learn to sculpture on school. I didn't learn to work with a computer on school. So you would wondering what did I learn? But I learned to develop my own language. I learned the difference between um, good and bad taste. I learned to, um, the difference between a good and a bad line. And I think if you have uh, two good hands, you can easily start with uh, woodworking machines and, and uh, try to study that. If you have a little bit of um, knowledge and um, uh, feeling about computer, you can easily open a software and, and start to experiment. But I think to, to develop your own language and to develop what is like um, good and bad, I think it's something very difficult. And there's not yet a book that is describing that because I think it's, it's impossible to, to put like sort of belly feeling uh, inside an instruction manual. Um, I had a fantastic teacher. I think everybody had um, one teacher that was like a sort of mentor that um, opened your eyes uh, for you. And for me, that was um, um, an artist, uh, Danny Mates. Um, uh, he's actually now on uh, the document also. And he was, um, he, his first um, marriage was actually live on the national TV because it was, um, he saw his marriage as an artwork. So he did some really crazy stuff. He was one of the first artists in Belgium uh, making art with uh, Polaroid photography. But then he, he made some really strange decisions in his life. Um, he moved to uh, Australia. Um, he lived uh, between the originals, um, started to paint over his Polaroids. So really strange works that um, took a long time for me to, to start to understand them. But what he did was like putting all the classmates uh, every Monday morning around the table. I can guarantee Monday morning for an art school that was already uh, a challenge. And everybody had to explain his work to his uh, fellow students. Um, you get like in a new class and you're explaining your work and the one is saying, oh, I hate that or I already saw that or um, you are saying that but I don't see it. So you would for less being uh, maybe depressive and uh, a few weeks on your bed. But it started that you really start to think, why do I do art? What do I want to say? What is my work about? And for me, it was really a very um, good education in getting uh, verbal. I would not stand here today um, talking so easy to you if I didn't have that as a sort of experience. Another idea was that my teacher would um, move apart. And how concentrated is that student? Did he see that something has uh, changed? Did he see that uh, that made the artwork better or that made the artwork uh, worse? How concentrated is that student? So we learned a lot from each other, uh, even without um, speaking it in words. Um, another thing is that like on an age of 19, 20, I don't come from a cultural background. And of course, you're studying art. Will you be able to, to live from that? What will be your future? Why are you doing that? It's something that is, of course, um, uh, very difficult. And especially if your parents are not from a cultural background. I think my father had a long time, oh no, what have I done? I made a son that is playing with plaster in his uh, back garden and all things like that. So for me, that teacher was really like um, a person that had like a sort of hand above my head as sort of a father figure and give you um, self-motivation that um, you were doing good, you were, um, um, you were doing something that um, has, um, has it right in the world to, to do so. Um, so, of course, then um, a cool time is coming. You're graduating. Um, but actually, the cool time was that you lived on uh, maybe the money of your parents and you had a really protected environment in school. And so the moment I graduated, um, yeah, it was really a search. And um, I started also to, to teach on uh, some different schools. And I think I teach between 2003 uh, when I graduated and around 2011. And today we are actually with um, a big team to, to make all the, the projects ready.
Um, so for the moment, I have um, an exhibition in Tokyo. Um, we just had uh, three shows in uh, South of France, uh, two shows in Belgium. I made um, an eight meter high sculpture in uh, Belgium, a seven meter high sculpture in the Netherlands. And now I'm working on a big um, ceramic sculpture for next year in uh, the Netherlands on um, a sculpture in, of 200 square meters in uh, Cornstel for um, a school in Brussels. So of course you're not doing that alone anymore and, and you really need people to, to help you, especially with this kind of uh, big size sculptures. Um, back to the beginning, um, I graduated in 2003, but um, like Sobekops is uh, one of my ideas of uh, 2007. And the moment I graduated, I was really bored about sculpture. I had the idea that I understand it. Of course, that was um, a big illusion. So I was really um, attracted to, um, to architecture. Um, for me and architecture, they were really making a new language. Um, I don't know if anybody has an idea like um, with how many people uh, Zahadid was, uh, was working on her office. Not to build the buildings, but, but really to, um, um, to design them. Anybody that wants to do a guess? I, 200, a little bit more. <coughs> um, Zahadid worked on, on her top moment with more than 700 people. And there were already like 70 people working for free just to have like the names I did on their resume. So that's of course something very strange, but you can even go further like um, Norman Foster's in England, he worked with a team of 1500 people. So that's so crazy, but what is the, the interesting thing on that? If he has like a new idea to make like um, a new um, a roof for um, a big airport and everybody says, no, your idea is impossible. They put 10 engineers on it, they put 10 programmers on it, and I find a solution. And that's what I really find attractive on the work of Sarah Hadid, that um, thanks to the computer, she was really making a new language. And that's of course what uh, was interesting me, and I really wanted to, to um, take that kind of feeling into my, uh, into my artwork. Um, I didn't learn to work with a computer on school. I had some Photoshop lessons and things like that, but even today, on an art school in Belgium, there's not yet 3D education, 3D software education. So the moment I graduated, I started to, to follow like um, evening schools, but then you have a teacher that just was reading like uh, the manual. Um, then I followed like uh, big um, expensive um, master classes with uh, Autodesk and you get like your neighbor. Okay, what are you doing from a job? Oh, I'm the head engineer of uh, Shell that is uh, doing the oil rigs around the world. Okay, I understand I was not on my place. Then I did a workshop in um, the Netherlands. I got like um, one week lessons of um, Karl Balda. It's really one of the top people of uh, Pixar that worked on um, uh, Toy Story, Monster Inc. But it was also um, a sort of illusion. You see that those people are used to work in big teams. If they're working with 200 people on like uh, 3D animation and they have maybe a few second films every day, good job, good working day. So of course, as an artist um, on your own, you're very limited and you don't have tried to, to compete with that. You have to take different roads. So I started to make a sort of sculpture that were playing with a sort of um, old and new. You can see like um, the, the square. It's um, the way that architects were working in the past with really square houses. And then the blob, it's like the more organic. It's the way that um, artists are working today and architecture is working today with a lot of computer. Um, I'm playing with a lot of, um, 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 uh, a lot of um, things that uh, go in conflict. Like for me, sculpture is always about um, round against square, uh, man against female, uh, dark against light, uh, heavy against light. It's almost um, uh, searching for the comparisons. Um, you have like the wood, um, it's a natural material against the yellow that is an industrial material. Um, if you look to the sculpture, it's almost like um, a scale model. It's a sculpture, but it's also a pavilion. It's a architecture. And I really play with the boundaries between um, art, uh, design and uh, architecture. So this is actually a computer model. Um, what is um, realistic, what is photography is um, the air and uh, the buildings the plants, the sculpture, um, the concrete, it's all drawn by the computer. And of course, I'm doing a lot of um, uh, government uh, commissions, like um, big size sculpture for a hospital, 
and um, you don't see here an artist with uh, dreadlocks and all the paint over. And of course, if you go today to, to a border of directors and you want to, to sell your product, you want to sell your sculpture, you don't do it with a sketch from, yeah, maybe it will look like that or maybe it will look like that. No, those people, they mostly don't have a lot of um, imagination anymore. Um, they also have to, to protect their self and uh, um, for us, uh, they have to um, uh, compete to their bosses. So you really need to have a design to show people how it would look like, um, how it would be, how it would, uh, would see. This is actually the, the physical model. It's only uh, like uh, one meter by one meter. It's uh, one of the first yellow blobs I made, still on a very classical, old school way. Uh, I made the model in clay, uh, then with um, a plaster mold, and then a fiberglass uh, top over it. Also, the wood is a combination of um, um, natural wood, but also like um, some parts with veneer, what is already a picture of wood. So you're really playing with those kind of uh, dimensions. Um, I was really attracted to architecture and I started to, to make like um, animations. Um, I was inspired by um, an old uh, Mirator hospital that was for me a sort of uh, typical 19th century uh, architecture style and I really played with it. I, I made like a sort of UFOs, um, houses that were folding open and it's actually about imagination. Of course in Belgium like um, the work of Magritte, the, the surrealism, uh, it's something that is really in our culture that, that has a heavy uh, connotation. And you could say that the bottom chimneys are like the pillars of the sculpture. Um, the bottom rooftop is like um, the basement and then you have a first, second floor. So it's not because the sculpture is looking um, upside down from the outside that from the inside it could be perfectly uh, normal. Um, I went even one step further and I didn't want to make like um, a model in, in cardboard or in paper. I really wanted to, to build a house. So I went to um, uh, those kind of um, uh, model maquette uh, shops and I said, okay, I went to order 10,000 little bricks. Um, it was too expensive. They only sold it in a package of 20. So I came up with the idea um, with just making my own brick factory. I made uh, 10,000 bricks by, by hand just um, the, the dough grower I took to, to put over the clay. And I went for the smallest brick that is in my opinion um, possible to, to build with human mankind. And that was like a brick of five millimeter on five millimeter on nine millimeter. Um, I made 10,000 of bricks and I made uh, this kind of uh, scale models. Uh, the only big frustration was that today a building constructor is building like a real size house at the time I made a small model. Um, it's also um, a really cool thing. It's like, it's a physical sculpture, but at the same time for me, it's also um, a video still. Because I was making animations where the sculpture was like folding open. And I was not interested in the moment that like the house is closed or the moment that the house is open, but I was interested in the transition, the moment that it's uh, changing. And I think a good artwork has a lot of levels. You don't always have to explain everything, but how more that you, you learn about it, how more that it's going open and how more levels it's giving to you. Because everybody is looking and if I say, do you see a house, everybody will say yes. But at the same time, you don't see a house anymore because the definition of a house is a closed space with a rooftop. And we don't have a closed space anymore. We still have the brick wall, we still have the rooftop. But it's not a definition anymore from architecture. So if it's not architecture anymore, what does it is? And actually, if it's not functional, it can be a sculpture. And the big yellow egg you can see as like the birth of organic sculpture. It's like um, uh, almost uh, the head of Brancusi. It's like the sublime of uh, an organic shape. But today it would be possible to build it like a huge apartment building, to have it like as a big egg of like um, eight, uh, eight floors high. It would be perfectly possible to make like a yellow print on the outside and from the inside look perfectly clear to the glass with um, little dots and uh, technical illusions, it's perfectly possible. And I'm of course playing with architecture becoming sculpture, sculpture becoming architecture. The outside wall is also the inside wall. The um, windows on the yellow egg are actually the reflections of um, uh, the windows of the outside wall. So how more you're looking, how more levels and uh, directions you will see. Going one step further. Um, 
also a lot of artworks um, are coming because of you, you get chances in your life. Um, we have a typical um, uh, seacoast town where um, they still have this kind of typical architecture style. And I was invited as an artist to, to make a piece for the exhibition that would say something about the architecture of that town. So if I, didn't, uh, if I was not invited for that show, this work would never have been there in my, uh, my work. Um, again, the, the sky and the plants are um, uh, physical photography. And uh, the water, the sand, and the buildings are completely drawn in computer. It's really, for me, almost like um, um, the elephant that is escaped from uh, the paintings of Dali. It's really um, giving a sort of animals, but an architecture skill. I really made a sort of um, analyze of what kind of uh, typical architecture styles we had in that time. And I tried to combine them over uh, those pieces. And this is actually a first model. It's around one meter by one meter. And this is uh, 3D printed. Um, my first idea was, of course, to, to work in uh, wood and uh, to glue all little bricks on it like I did with uh, those previous models, like uh, with the egg. But the problem was, um, yeah, there was no uh, corner the same. Everything was crooked. Everything had different uh, corners, different uh, grease, different dimensions. So it was really complicated. So I started to, to make like um, a cardboard model. Um, if people know um, the software uh, Pipakura, it's really a crazy software. It's like a Japanese uh, origami software for children. But I could actually make a sort of cardboard model with, uh, with this model. But I didn't want it, of course, to have a cardboard model with just uh, the print on. I wanted to have really the bricks and the dimension. So it took me around three, four months to draw it in computer to do, draw all the parts and, and then maybe one month to, to print all the parts and again one month to really assemble it. So it is just a lot of work and if you look to like the buildings you, you have like in uh, mini Europe, sometimes they are like working six months on one model and it all looks easy, it all looks obvious if you see it on an exhibition. But this is of course uh, craftsmanship. Um, this is printed with um, um, an FDM printer, uh, fuse depositing modeling. It's a printer, the 4250 from, from Stratasys. But of course, you can do it on um, a lot of different ways. And I will come back also. And it's really printed with even the connection points. It's a little bit like um, the little toys you have from uh, the chocolate eggs, the, the Kinder Surprise, and, and really make your own uh, assemble to, to cover everything. I, um, I lived for a few months in Berlin and I was really um, inspired by like um, uh, when there are road constructions and they, they put like um, um, the, the water, uh, they don't close it, they put it uh, with tubes above the ground. And I was invited by um, the director of um, Contemporary Art Museum in Ghent to do an exhibition um, in a fantastic old um, textile factory. But I forgot to mention one thing, it was not an exhibition with four artists on that floor, but um, every artist got like a floor of 400, 500 square meter. The exhibition is in two months and we would love to have new work of you. Of course, the things that I'm doing with the computer, they are not going so fast. So I get up with the idea of making like a big uh, coral, a big um, network, a big uh, structure. The idea was to make it in iron. Of course, I didn't have the money. So I came up with the idea of just buying like the typical old um, uh, sewers um, the, the plastic uh, tubes and I um, see and see uh, the circles around it and I started to, to make um, my own sort of uh, Meccano building construction package. The cool thing is that um, it came like a sculpture of 8 meter by 8 meter but I still can move it with my truck. It's like the most um, um, crazy, the most um, um, cool sculpture I ever made to stock it because mostly if you make big pieces and they are not sold, where do you go with them? So on that level, I can just um, put it like in one box of uh, one square meter. I'm only three days busy with um, screwing everything together and uh, apart. 
Um, the same idea was growing, and I I'm really uh, impressed by like uh, the Basilica in Brussels. If you enter Brussels, you really get uh, like that crazy building. It's um, a Basilica and um, Art Deco style. It's like uh, one kind uh, of uh, architecture, and I wanted to make a sort of um, homage to to that kind of architecture. So I I draw actually the whole Basilica uh, in a computer. And I only uh, reserved like uh, the lines, the ribs of uh, the architecture. Um, the idea is actually that you would have like a similar building construction package, like you had with a coral. Um, I did like um, a cool exhibition in a government building. They had like 20 doors, but I even didn't have a double door. They were all single doors. So we have a lot of museums in Belgium, and luckily we have cool museums. But most of our buildings were not meant to be a museum and they are not um, they don't have big doors they don't have big elevators because the the building had uh, a previous functions in the past so here would actually be the idea that as an artist you could come with your um, back package you go into the small door and you build your big construction inside what they have mostly big spaces um, it can be a truck instead of just a backpack but uh, um, if you would build it, it would be um, 140 meter long. I'm realistic, it will probably never happen. But um, as an artist, you don't have to, to put that idea in your basement. You can really show it to people. Like here, the, um, um, the sky is a photography, but everything else is drawn by computer. So the water, the plants, everything is done by computer. And I think everybody has immediately the feeling that this is there in the space. You have immediately a feeling of scale because of the water. And of course, there are some little tricks for scale. You can put uh, measurements on your um, ID, like uh, an architecture plan. You can put a figure that giving a dimension. Or you can, of course, work with uh, the environment that gives a scale to, uh, to everything. This is um, the physical model, not 120, uh, but uh, 140 centimeter long. And it's completely 3D printed. Um, when people saw it in the exhibition, they didn't thought about 3D printing. I don't want that people have, ah, wow, cool, it's a 3D print. No, you want that people say, oh, wow, a cool uh, artwork or a nice artwork or an interesting artwork. So um, the inside is printed in uh, SLA and the outside is printed in uh, SLS. And it's um, all covered. So one is uh, polished, so you have really like uh, the yellow uh, finishing. And the other one is um, a sort of um, um, rust imitation. So we really have the idea of it's almost like uh, steel. And it's all printed in parts and uh, put together. It was um, a big risk, and I think as an artist, but, but even as a, a businessman, as an entrepreneur, you don't have to play safe, because then never, will, never uh, anything will happen. The production cost to print this was um, the wage I earned as a, um, uh, a part-time teacher. So it was like the wage I earned in one year, I put in that one sculpture. So of course, my parents were saying, you're crazy. Of course, I was thinking, oh, what the hell I'm doing now? Um, but luckily, it was sold on the exhibition. So yeah, sometimes you, you have to go for it. Um, one of the um, really changing moments for me is like the, the time of 2009. I was invited to do um, an exhibition in the, the Moka Museum in Shanghai, Museum of Contemporary Art. And I was really scared because um, I don't know a lot about uh, Chinese culture. Um, most of um, Chinese artwork that I love is because of um, certain people that are already living a long time in the West and has taken our thinking pattern. So I wanted to make an artwork that could be in um, both cultures. Um, I visited a few times Shanghai and I was really impressed by um, the, the feeling you have in the temple gardens and like um, the rocks you have with um, the cut out um, the cutout rocks by the water. And I'm a huge fan of um, uh, British sculptor um, Henry Moore. That is for me really like um, the inventor of uh, abstract sculpture. Um, and I wanted to, to have like um, the knowledge of um, an Asian world, the knowledge of a Western world, and make a sort of uh, combination of that. So the idea was to make like um, a futuristic rock. Um, Sounds, of course, much um, uh, easier than, uh, than to start with it. And what is for me very interesting when I studied the work of Henry Moore is that Henry Moore is actually seen together with uh, Barbara Hepworth in that time as one of the inventors to make holes in sculptures. 
today it's very logic that we have all holes and um, openings and, and objects. But um, it may be a challenge, but I think before 100 years ago, you cannot find any examples of that in a Western culture. Um, like the, the Greek and Roman statues, they have maybe a hollow part under the arm. But the idea of an opening in a, in a sculpture is actually a very new idea. Because a sculpture in the past, he could only carve in his block of marmor or his block of wood till where his sizzle could reach. And of course, today with, with technologies like 3D printing, we, we can go on a completely different level. Um, I actually started with um, just um, simple box modeling, um, making this kind of um, sketches. I made like uh, 200, 300 variations of that sculpture till the moment I was saying I cannot improve the sculpture anymore. Then in my opinion, you, you're going to a master work to, to, to the most um, perfect sculpture that is possible at that time in your thinking pattern. Um, you can always make a different sculpture, but to finish it, to, to have it like on the limitations that is possible. Um, my other problem was, of course, um, transport budget. I didn't have a big budget to do big transports at that time, so I actually really designed the sculptures at the size of the, the hand baggage, and I took my first uh, sculptures just with my hand baggage to uh, Shanghai, to the museum. Um, I think you can imagine if you see this to a scanner, and if you would do that today, <coughs> you get some scary um, uh, feelings. Um, Left, you have, of course, the, the digital model, and right, you have uh, the physical sculpture. I really had to convince 3D print companies in the beginning to, to print that. They didn't believe it, it was possible. And two years later, I could give uh, lectures to those engineers. So you really have to, to challenge people and, and to, to try things out. What is, for me, very interesting, I don't want to do the same like uh, sculptures in the past. It's maybe still a naive idea, but I want to see what is sculpture today. Um, how can I, as an artist of my time, put something extra to the story of sculpture? And that will probably be um, a lifetime ambition. If an artist as um, Henry Moore had an idea, he had first the idea in his head, then he has to draw his three-dimensional idea on a two-dimensional paper, giving it a three-dimensional impression, then go to three-dimensional model. You can imagine that it's, it's a complete, uh, complicated story, but a sculpture like this, you can never invent it in your brain. Your brain is too limited. You can never have this kind of complexity in your head. It's only by drawing on a computer and save it and working on it the next day and working on it the next day and trying to copy paste that you can be able to create uh, this kind of complex uh, shapes and things. So for me, it was a sort of futuristic rock. Of course, with this scale, small sculpture, you cannot build up your, um, your exhibition. So I made um, a 3D animation where you had like a really fly through uh, in the sculpture. This is actually a video still from inside the sculpture. So it was like an animation of around five minutes where you are really like roller coasting inside the sculpture. And the beautiful thing is if you look to those kind of images, you're like feeling in a really big uh, plateau uh, cave, um, but uh, you're actually looking to this kind of really small scale uh, sculpture. Of course, I wanted to build this kind of sculptures on a big size. Um, there are no yet uh, printers going this kind of big size. On the other side, I didn't have the budget to uh, print like really big size sculptures. So I really studied how did sculptures do it in the past? How did they work? What kind of um, solutions did they have? And I think it's also um, a pity that a lot of knowledge is um, lost every time. Like. Um, um, Chinese people have invented a lot of um, um, the, the boat constructions and a lot of um, uh, sea um, elements already in the 15th century and Europe reinvented in the 17th century but the knowledge was lost for 200 years and then was reinvented and I think it's the same if we look to Leonardo da Vinci his knowledge was lost for 300, 400 years and then suddenly new people started to reinvent it or to pick up his knowledge. And I think that's interesting to really learn the history and, and see how you can take an extra step and then go on to that. Um, of course, you have a lot of um, different ways of uh, 3D printing. This is um, a picture of uh, the printer I had at home. It's um, an FDM printer. And you could really say it's like just um, a tiny wire of plastic. It's melted on uh, 70 degrees. And it's like um, you print with your normal printer, but instead of inked, it's uh, plastic. 
and it's printing 0 0.1.4 millimeter with like a tiny layer of plastic. And then with an elevator, it's going down and again a layer and again a layer and again a layer and again a layer. Um, people are asking me, can we see it? Yeah, of course you can see it, but like printing just this piece of 10 centimeters is like 200 hours. Um, there's no resume button. So, of course, I was first buying such a kind of machine and then, okay, no resume button and uh, the power, okay, you're not happy, so you're starting to buy batteries. Then it's printing in two materials, like um, the model material, but of course, if I would print here, the physical law say, okay, gravity, so you're printing also the mold, so you're printing in uh, two materials. So then you need like um, a bat with um, natrium hydroxide, a sort of um, um, sewer material to, to clean uh, the model. Then I started to buy a washing machine to clean um, uh, the chemicals, uh, an oven to uh, get um, uh, the wet fluid out of it. So of course it looks all very nice if you see it, but the moment that you're really doing it, you start to have a lot of uh, difficulties especially because I was making really complex shapes. I think 50% really worked and 50% just was a failure. Um, so I actually sold the machine because it was uh, too limited for me. Give you an idea. It's working with a sort of um, honey degree. So you have um, uh, safety of material because of course the material is, uh, is very expensive. But at the same time, um, it's a, a pattern law eh, that they have um, they can ask what they want because you need to have this kind of materials. Uh, it's only with the cheaper printers that you can put um, yourself your own material in it. I started to design a sort of um, animals, a sort of um, um, pets of the future. You have like um, the ears of a devil, um, the back of a lion, uh, the back of a bison, the, the, the hand and the feet of a crab. And this is my vision how maybe um, pets in the future could look like, or I think the children of our children will be able to take, okay, some robotica, some organic tissue, and maybe they will be able to um, create their own pet. So for me, it's about uh, fascination. And of course, you still see my um, sort of futuristic rocks, my inspiration on the, the Yung Yang Garden in, uh, in Shanghai. Or I think if you would uh, come up to uh, this little pet, it's maybe not uh, the nicest pet. But what is interesting is that this is a, a sculpture without a volume. It's almost like drawing a line in the dimension. Um, there's no part in the sculpture that is thicker than two centimeter. It are just all lines. It would be impossible if you would carve this on a manual way. And this is what is interesting. I would say if you have an ID and you can do it in another material than 3D printing, just do it in another material because it will probably be a lot cheaper. But I'm interested in what are the limitations of 3D printing and how can you um, play and, and, and flirt with this kind of limitations and what are the, the boundaries of it. Um, of course, you have to have um, some luck also in your career. I did um, an exhibition in the, this building. It's um, from um, uh, an entrepreneur in Belgium, like um, Yomega. Uh, here are um, uh, 70 apartments. Here is um, meeting rooms of two floors, and here is an exhibition space of two floors. And he asked me, yeah, I have uh, two rooftop uh, terraces. Um, I would love to have a sculpture on that. Can you do me um, a proposal? So it, it can really start so easy. So this was actually one of my first ideas, but I thought, okay, now this will be too impressive. It will be too expensive. I have to make more normal ideas. I have to downsize my ideas. But when um, he and his family saw that it was, okay, when can you deliver? And this was, of course, something that I have no experience with. I was working alone. I was ordering like one liter of fiberglass and suddenly I took the telephone and I said, okay, can you deliver next week a thousand liters of fiberglass? So they called 10 times back to be sure that this was the correct amount. So I had not the physical place, I had not the people. So it was really a big deal to, to search how to deal with that. And actually the sculpture is actually done by machines. We cut um, uh, the sides just in wood by a CNC machine. Then we actually made our own machine. It sounds bigger than it actually is, but you have like a little machine of wood cutting to, to, to make a corner. 
we built a sort of this kind of machine on a big size so I could make the corner in this kind of uh, foam. And then it took around with 12 people three months to truly polish it. And that's of course manually because there's no um, shaving machine that has this kind of flexible corners. You have to do this kind of uh, manual things. What I didn't realize on that moment is that um, that client uh, asked that question to several artists. Um, but I'm the only artist that took the chances. And of course, it's much more than just making a nice design. You have to make agreements. You have to make a contract. You have to convince him of your design. You have to make uh, good agreements. Um, the client was visiting me like one time while I was uh, making this piece. Um, for me, that was obvious. But of course, it's not obvious. You're working with his money, with a lot of money, uh, to make this piece. But in that one visit, he saw that I had everything under control and he was convinced that I would manage the job. So, of course, it's building up. And what is uh, very difficult in um, an art world and a cultural world, today, almost all jobs are demanding five-year experience. But of course, if you graduate and you can never have the chance to build up that experience, you will never get a job. So, it's the same with like government um, uh, commissions. They ask uh, references, but of course you have to have one time that chance to, to build that kind of reference. And of course from that day it was for me really a reference to, to show people that I could not only draw them in computer, but I was also able to make them on a really physical scale. That's uh, to give an idea about the transport or the installation or how it looks uh, physically. Um, the same client is actually expanding and expanding, so I got again a commission from the same client to make an even um, bigger work. We, we closed uh, the highway for two days to, to uh, be able to install it. And that's actually a sculpture of almost um, 50 meter high, and there's actually a bar with um, piranha fishes and uh, all cool stuff like that inside. So it's uh, really crazy to, to meet clients that give you this kind of uh, possibilities. Or um, sometimes uh, things can go very strange. I have a friend, he's a painter, and he has some clients in Spain, and they were searching for a sculpture, but my friend was not making sculptures. So he advised me uh, to them, and they were asking to, to design a six meter sculpture for their uh, private garden. So this is my uh, first piece in uh, Spain. Of course, I really love the color yellow. And they came to me and said, um, Nick, we love your work but we don't love that color. So of course, as an artist, then you can decide, decide, oh no, it has to be that color, or you can help thinking with that client. And of course, I think for yourself, you, you make uh, somewhere um, the, um, the limit. Um, I think there would not be um, outside sculptures or um, commissions if you don't um, uh, go a little bit in a conversation with your client. If you're like the artist that's saying like this and no other way, then I think it will be very difficult to work on a commission based. Um, of course, you put on yourself a sort of limitation because you don't want suddenly that the client is making all the decisions. Um, the left is also one of my very first sculptures. And of making the big one, I, I started with the idea to, to hire much more companies to help me with uh, making my sculptures. But those companies uh, said very fast to me, we're not able to read your plan. Because like the typical plan you have from architecture, the top, the side, the back, it's very easy to, to see how um, a typical house is looking. But this kind of sculptures are much more complicated. So my only solution was actually to build up an own company, to build up an own system. And I learned a lot of how um, sculptures like Michelangelo did it in the 15th century, how uh, 3D printers are working. And I started to, to make my own uh, sort of sculpture techniques to, to make this kind of big size sculptures. The left is um, a sculpture that is bought by a um, hospital now. And the right was um, a private commission for um, uh, an eye uh, surgeon. How my sculptures would look like um, on a design level as a bench. This is also one that is inspired, of course, on nature and really the, the branches and uh, the typical uh, root formations. For me, a sculpture has to have this kind of um, 
imagination. You have to to almost feel it moving. It's almost like I want sculptures that are like a little bit like an animation. Um, there are actually physical dead pieces. There are no engine in it. They're they're not moving, but you have to feel it moving in uh, inside you. This is my uh, workshop today. Um, and this is uh, my first big uh, commission for uh, the Netherlands. It's in uh, Emmen, um, close to uh, Groningen. And here I was invited on a sort of um, closed contest. Um, you have, for example, open contests, and then you have 100, 500 artists doing a proposal. Of course, the chance that you win something like that is, is very limited. Here we were only with four artists invited, so you know I get 25% chance to, uh, to get this uh, assignment. But it was much more than just showing them a nice sculpture. They had a really complicated history with the city. And they were actually asking the artist to search for a solution. And I think that's a beautiful thing on a profession as an artist that you're dealing with conflicts, dealing with uh, searching for solutions. They had a big zoo, um, a zoo that attracts more than one million visitors. But like it happens in a lot of cities, the zoo was stuck in the center and has no possibility anymore to expand. So they really moved the zoo to completely the other side of the city. But all the shops were very scared that people would only visit uh, the zoo and not go anymore in the city. Yeah, the, the horeca, all the terraces were really afraid that they have to close their restaurant, their bar, their shops. So as an artist, you were invited to deal with this kind of conflict. It is a city where they built um, a lot of factories for 10,000 jobs but all the factories have moved to, to um, cheaper countries. So there's a lot of um, um, uh, people that are without a job. So it's a really conflict, uh, complicated place. And they get um, a big um, um, a budget from a European Commission to redevelop the area. And they built like a, a new um, uh, park with like 100 meter um, um, play area for children, um, a skate park. Um, and there's um, an architect that actually designed for two years on the park. And as a sculptor, I had something, yeah, he did a fantastic job. Everything is designed so good, there's no place anymore to really put something extra to it. So it was a really difficult question. And I think I did not want this only with a good design, but I won it because I showed them a good solution. And you had like this ugly concrete block from the underground parking and I actually used it as a sort of a free pedestal. And for the architect, it was amazing because his vision of the park, he will only be able to see it in 10 years when the trees are growing and things like that. And it's a big open space and the sculpture is like the only thing that has a little bit um, um, a size control on the area. Um, it's not a culture region. So on a political level, they were really scared what would be the opinion of uh, the people on this culture. So I really tried to connect it to their culture. And it's inspired on um, a typical um, tree root of that area. Um, uh, the sculpture is called Egnober, and uh, Nabor is an uh, entrance in their dialect, it's a neighbor. So you're really playing with all uh, kinds of elements like that. Um, from the bottom water till the top, it's around uh, 10 meter. This is to give an idea. There, there are just uh, blocks of um, uh, uh, polyurethane foam that are really all put together and then it's really a manual process of uh, shaving it and on the next level it's putting fiberglass and, and really polish and shaving it. And this is for example the, the result. It's um, also a sculpture for a um, hospital in uh, the Netherlands. It's around six, seven meter high. Um, this is a sculpture inspired, of course, on the, the Art Nouveau and, and really the typical um, entrances we know from the metros in Paris, from uh, Hector Guimard, and the bottom is inspired on the, the mangrove roots. So it's really like a, a lantern, but at the same time, they have the feeling of sort of uh, dragon heads and uh, the water is like really sipping. Um, if you just would put a spot in it, you will never have the idea that it's illuminating. So the whole uh, element is covered with uh, LED light, so you really have that kind of, um, of a feeling. Um, this was one of the most uh, difficult projects. I was invited um, for a really big um, sculpture exhibition, but along the, the coastline. 
So you can imagine the coastline, you have the sand, you have the salt, you have uh, really the most strong wind we, you can imagine. So to build a sculpture over there, and of course the beach is, is so huge, um, you have never that kind of a place at an exhibition or even if you show your sculpture um, in your studio, a sculpture of four meter looks like really big in your studio and put it on an outside space where suddenly you have a tree of 20 meter, it's, it's nothing, it's so small. So here I made a sculpture of eight meter, but of course at the coast it's, it's really small. Um, there is almost 1500 kilo of metal inside the sculpture. There are um, three blocks of um, like one square meter of uh, concrete underneath um, to really get it like uh, this kind of protection. And of course you have to have um, a good conversation. Like a private client is of course immediately asking how long will your sculptures exist? And of course you have to be able to give an answer on that. Here it's very simple with the salt and the sea, the paint will only last for five years. So you have to find people that want to buy it and to repaint it every five years, what is of course a cost. Um, on a technical level, the sculpture will always be very good, but the paint will of course, by the salt and the sand, uh, lose its color. On a normal conditions, I mostly say that, um, uh, compare it a little bit with a car. You have to wash the sculpture every year. Maybe after eight, nine years, you have to uh, um, uh, polish it, and then your sculpture can be very safely 30, 60 years. Um, it's a big illusion that um, everything is forever. Even um, a bronze sculpture or a stone cold sculpture, you, you have uh, maintenance on everything that is in an outside world. It's differently than something that you put inside. Um, of course, the, the content of the sculpture is very easy. It's like the, the splashing water we know from the sea. I put like three legs under it, so it's getting more like a creature that is almost like um, a walk at night along uh, the, the beach. Um, another solution was for this uh, old chapel. From um, the heritage law, it was not allowed to remove the old door. But the old uh, door and stone was completely damaged, but um, they wanted to protect it. Of course, my client, uh, private client, wanted to have um, uh, a new feeling to, to this chapel. So I came up with the idea, um, I invented a new door inspired on the old door. And actually the, the wide door is completely hollow inside. So it just clicks over the old door. It's with four screws putting everything together. And Heritage is happy because uh, the Heritage door is protected. And my client is happy because he could renovate his building. So that's of course sometimes very strange, but every country has its own laws and you have to deal with it. And I think art is very beautiful that um, it's not always clear if you need like a building permission for art, yes or no. So I think art has the luxury that it's uh, not really um, a big uh, sector, so the law is uh, flexible on that level. Or um, an inner court. This is for um, a retiring home. Um, of course, not always the most um, pleasant places and mostly a lot of places where there's no color. So I really wanted to make a, a dynamic sculpture and it's like the, just the idea of like a little brick that is falling in the water and you get like the splashes and um, the yellow parts are sitting bench, the orange parts are um, uh, places where you can lean and there's even uh, a playground where you have like uh, your own fitness devices. It was also the idea to have um, an area that was um, uh, easy to clean. So actually the grass is uh, fake grass, but today you have well, of course a very good imitation and the only things that are actually real are like uh, little, little plants. Um, I was very happy. I called the book of uh, Guinness Records. I was um, interested what is like the biggest um, print ever made. Um, two dimensional, the world record is uh, 6,000 square meter. Unfortunately, this is only 2,000 square meter, but I'm, I'm getting there. Um, I was invited to make um, a sculpture for an exhibition, uh, an exhibition that was along the water. Uh, of course, put like a sculpture of three, four meter against this factory of 30 meter high, it has no use. That factory is so big. So I came up with the idea like crystal to, to really wrap in the whole factory, but not just with fab fabric, but really with um, a design, with a drawing. Um, what was for me the most difficult thing, you had like all those chimneys and those windows they could not be removed. Everything that could be removed is already removed. So it's a little bit like a painter. 
you have your big, nice, white canvas, and I cut out some parts of it, and you have to deal with that. So I made like this kind of um, uh, lines, this kind of uh, grid, and it gives me the idea to make a sort of Röntgen picture to show like different kind of levels that could exist uh, after that wall um, in the space. And at the same time, they're giving references to, to Mondrian, to, to Donald Chut. And I played with um, almost like the, the cancer, the black, the, the evil coming from the hell, and then like uh, the good, the yellow, uh, the magma coming from the heaven. And in the middle, they go like an embracement or a fight. You can always read them on, um, on the two levels. And that's for me really important to, to play with this kind of different layers. It's a grain factory, so my client he just wanted to have some uh, yellow pieces and that was fine for him. But for me as an artist, it needed um, a bigger story. And of course, because of those kind of lines, I could easily in the computer give the, f the one moment my sculpture, bring it front of it, bring it back, and you get really an immense feeling of depth while this is actually just a flat drawing. Uh, you can still uh, visit it uh, if you're a Belgian. Um, another assignment I got was from a, an architect. Um, again, a chapel. Put a sculpture of like um, 50 centimeter, three meter in a chapel. Uh, even in this kind of space, put a sculpture of two meter here and it's lost because we have such a big space. So I was again struggling. The budget is mostly limited um, and you really had to find a solution. So I came up with the idea to, to make um, a big um, wall painting. Um, my problem was, uh, you can all calculate it, but the moment that I was able to install it, they had um, raised the floor with one meter, so I'm not allowed anymore to go with, uh, with trucks and um, uh, uh, elevators on it, so we had to do it like uh, with um, just normal uh, uh, stelling. Um, at the other side, architecture has um, a lot of times a delay, so the moment I was painting this, they were also painting uh, the white walls and they were putting the floor. So you have to be very <coughs> uh, attractive on that. Um, my big problem was to use a projector was impossible because you have a curved ceiling like this, but it's also curved the other way around. So how would I be able to put my drawing on that? I started to develop a sort of software where I really could put open my drawing like you have with um, uh, the earth globe. Um, but it didn't work, so actually the old solution was to, to do it just the old school and okay, at this point and this point and this point and this point and then just drawing a little bit like uh, you had in your mind and you have to get on certain point on that point to get uh, the next connection. So we actually uh, did it just manually because it's um, a heritage building. We were not allowed to work with the prints uh, else we would um, uh, hide a lot of uh, the, the heritage uh, ornaments. So it took like four, um, four weeks with four people to, to just paint it on a, a manual level on that. Um, what is it interesting, uh, you can see it much better on my website, but um, it's an abstract drawing. But for me, it's also again a drawing about how we are thinking in a computer world. I take one of my um, yellow sculptures and I um, circled all the reflections, all the shadows, then I took away my picture and I came to this kind of abstract drawing. It's something about cartography, it has a little bit uh, Dell's blue, it's like um, uh, the stars in the sky, and it was also very important. For example, if you would put um, nudity or um, you put some really heavy colors, it would give um, a really impact on the space and you could not use the space anymore for everything. So I really want uh, not to be um, a dominant artist, but still has uh, to think about the functionality of the space. At the same time, here where the altar is, you have like uh, the good that is as a, an hurricane grabbing the, the evil, and at the beginning you have like the evil coming uh, inside. So it's a really abstract drawing, but if you look closer, you have different levels again uh, in it. Also in um, 2009, I met a professor, um, a Professor Lare, and he's uh, specialized in the larynx. Um, a big tube we have in our neck of uh, five centimeter, and if somebody has like uh, cancer on that tube, you are, you are dead, there are no solutions. So he invented together with his team a new solution. 
they would put the tube from um, uh, a passed away person, they would put it in the arm of the future patient. You're like um, running with a, a belly in your arm for two, three months, so it can adapt to your veins, and then they're actually replacing your tube. For me, this is like pure science fiction, but this is what uh, doctors, what they are do on a um, high medical level. And I was invited to do an exhibition where every artist had to collaborate with a surgeon. You saw like the scatrudial sculptures I made, those kind of um, uh, coral sculptures. Oh yeah, Nick is working with uh, tubes. Uh, we have a professor specialized in the tube. We put uh, those two together. And there, there grow um, a really interesting friendship. Um, I did an exhibition at the university and invited Professor Lara to show his medical drawings together with my work. I did um, a commission in his private garden. He made um, a medical book where every chapter of the medical book is starting with a drawing of me. And I was really fascinated by his story and I started to, um, to really design a sculpture built out of uh, organs. What is interesting, today we can 3D print um, in chocolate, we can 3D print in uh, wax and metal, um, we can 3D print in uh, plastic. Um, we can actually make uh, the human skeleton um, we can actually make the human skeleton much better than that um, uh, the evolution of Darwin could do. The only problem is we are not yet able to really replace the, the full schedule, uh, the full skeleton. Um, even, for example, uh, I don't uh, hope that somebody lose his leg, but instead of this kind of ugly prosthesis you have in this kind of uh, um, color of the skin, in the future you could have almost like artworks. And I think that's the most beautiful part. Um, in the past, if somebody had a, a knee operation, he had to choose between number one or five. Today, he may take a 3D scan and, and they can really print it on, on the size that you want it. Um, we have a company in Belgium that is called uh, Milot. And there's a company that is printing in titanium. And they are saying that they are like um, um, cheaper than, than like the low, uh, cheap countries. There's no company in Belgium that, that can uh, say something like that. But where you in the past go to the tendest and you get like all those clay in your mound to make the prothese and things like that. Today, they take a 3D scan. At night, they print it. And the uh, day after, the, the dental uh, artist can, uh, can really start to do the operation. So of course, we are living in a time where we will have a completely different idea about how technology is working. Um, People are thinking uh, IKEA is a big success. It's, it's cheap and um, uh, it's affordable. But 3D printing will allow that we will go back to a world where everybody will uh, try to have unique pieces. For example, in the future, we will not go to the shop to, to buy our glass or, uh, or cup of tea or something like that. We will just download it. We will be able to adapt it ourselves and then print it in uh, porcelain. It's no problem at all. But of course, how do you deal with um, something as a copyright? Because like as a designer, you, you want to have your royalties on your design. And what happens if somebody else is downloading your design and making his own design of it? So there's no law yet for what will the future bring. And I think that's really interesting. There are people now working on files that would, for example, destroy themselves after downloading six times. So you don't have suddenly that kind of design that is everywhere around the world, but you can keep it very limited. Um, we all love to, to eat and uh, we have to be uh, sometimes careful with our belly. But in the future, you will be standing there, there will be a scan and your clothes will just be printed on your size, but really on your size. Um, so these are all things that are not uh, future at all exist already, but it's still more expensive. And what will it do with the future? We know what did the industrial revolution, the textile revolution, what will happen if maybe in the near future everybody has a little factory and home and you don't have to go to the shop to buy your knife, you don't have to go to the shop to buy your plate, you don't have to go to the shop to buy your keychain. And I think you will have the most ugly designs ever because every young kid will start to make his own keychain and after one day maybe uh, already bored of it and uh, going to the garbage. So it's of course an evolution that we have to think about and, and how everything will evolve and, and deal. Um, this is actually the head I designed. It's um, a big head out of um, anatomical parts. 
It's like um, uh, the tubes of the lung or um, the comb of the punker. But I had no idea how to make it on a physical level. So I was really happy that I had the idea. I, I took an extra step in the, um, the history and uh, the story of sculpture. But I was also really frustrated that I had no idea how I would be able to make that. So for the exhibition, I did it as a, a big wall print. It's seven meter on eight meter. And people were really touching the wall because they didn't believe that, that it was possible to really make it uh, or to really um, have it in two dimensions. This is how it looks two dimensional. And I say two dimensional, but it's actually drawn in uh, 3D Max and 3D software. Um, what is the only problem with two dimensional that I mean is if you would put the camera like five degrees to there, you will see it's all rubbish. It's only working from that one kind of uh, point of view. And this is actually the physical model. It took me for more than two years and around 1,000 drawing hours, almost um, six months of full-time drawing, to actually design this piece. It was actually shown uh, a few years ago here in uh, Essen in a show from uh, Materialize, uh, a big uh, 3D printing company of Belgium. And of course, you have to be crazy as an artist to work like six months full-time on a piece without having a client, without knowing if you would ever be sell it. But at the same time, I think that's the cool thing. Um, you are an artist and you're not, um, sorry, a businessman. Of course, I'm, I'm manager and artist and you have to find a balance in life. But the moment that you're starting to think just as a manager or a businessman, you will never be able to, to make good art, I think. Um, the cool thing is that the sculpture is actually shown now in almost uh, 12 countries. And I'm actually um, loaning it from my clients to, to be able to, to show it around. Um, it's only like uh, 50 centimeter high, and every vein is like uh, two, three millimeter, and it's actually printed just in one piece. Of course, the difficult thing was to find um, a trick how to, to paint it. So it was actually almost making like a big bat and, and putting paint over it and paint over it and paint over it because even with a spray pistol, you would never be able to reach all uh, the insides and all the corners. And here you have a little bit an idea of uh, the bucket. Um, of course, I'm really fascinated by, by um, the portrait and history. So I'm making uh, much more of this kind of um, almost uh, alien, almost a little bit um, Gollywood uh, portraits. Um, in this uh, case, um, the yellow part is printed in one piece. All the black parts are uh, printed separately, so I could all paint them manually and then glue everything uh, together. Um, this one is for the moment on show in um, uh, Tokyo. Um, of course, uh, it's inspired on the, the Inca, Maya, on the, the typical Roman and Greek sculptures. And of course, in a Japanese culture, it gets uh, immediately the connotation with uh, the, the samurai armor. So that's, of course, cool how a sculpture can change of content the moment you're showing it in a different context or a, a different place. Um, this is um, a piece I designed around 200 hours on it, and it took around 1,500 hours to, to um, polish and post-process it. Because every piece you see, it is um, really like um, a big size puzzle of almost 200 pieces, and every piece is really like polished. A lot of people are calling me and asking, uh, yeah, where can I print uh, something really polished? Uh, they're always finished so nice from you, and I don't find any printer that is doing that. No, yeah, there's not yet a printer that is doing that. It's just manual labor. Um, to get a piece like that polished, it's really like um, putting a sort of um, spray filler on it, uh, shave it, again a spray filler, shave it, a first layer of paint, shave it, a second layer, uh, and a varnish. And then you get like this kind of perfect finishing. And it's not just polishing, it's first polishing it rough with um, uh, dents of 40, dents of 80, dents of 160, dents of 320, and maybe polish it even with a uh, uh, 400 that is really shaved uh, very smooth. And that's the only way to, to get this kind of almost um, um, alien perfection. Um, the blue is painted completely manually. Um, these are other pieces, they are also hand painted. And I think you can really compare it a little bit with um, when you go to a dentist and you have like all those mirrors in your mount and I'm making like pencils on just um, an electrical wire so I can uh, turn them and I can paint a little bit around the corner because I have to paint places where my eye can, cannot reach or uh, my fingers cannot reach. 
Um, this is a painting of uh, Peter Paul Rubens. Uh, I always have to be uh, careful with what I'm saying now. Um, but I was invited to do an exhibition in uh, Amsterdam, in the, the Hermitage. And I was really honored because you have the, the old Flemish masters and I was invited as the new Flemish masters. So you had a, a big honor. But I had to make a new work inspired on um, the paintings of um, uh, Rubens. Um, and I was searching for um, the organic shapes in the paintings of Rubens to make uh, this piece. Again, my sculpture was never on the exhibition. I didn't have time to, to finish it. But at the same time, um, left was my 3D animation. And right is actually the physical sculpture that I made on a later time. It's not the idea of presenting a man or a woman, but it's the idea of um, taking the, the breast, the bell cheeks, um, the cellulose, um, the human um, physical elements as an inspiration for a sculpture, the skeleton that is normally inside the body, putting outside the body. And I think the, the cool thing is also that I'm not just coming from a computer background. So I really have a knowledge of working with paint, of working in a wood shop. And I think if you look today to a lot of uh, 3D print exhibitions, you see a lot of 3D prints that are just pushed on the button and it's a result coming from the machine. But I'm really interested in, in how it's post-polished, um, how it's done, and it's completely painted manually. You have the idea of almost uh, two pieces uh, stuck in each other, but it's just designed like that. It's actually printed in one piece and then hand-painted. Um, I think you, you understand that what I'm saying, that I'm really a big fan of technology and of um, the future of human mankind. Um, I really love evolution and, and how the world is changing. But of course, I'm, I'm very aware that it has um, two sides. This is one of the more um, ugly stories of um, 3D printing. Um, this is 3D printed gun. Just with a cheap printer of 700 euros, you can print this gun in like, I think, 30 hours. Um, it's deadly. Um, it's only the, the bullet and um, the, the pen that is still of metal. But that means that you cannot uh, trace it anymore on the airport. You cannot trace it anymore on the train. So, of course, I think today we know um, with the start of 9-11, uh, but of all the, the attacks of today, we know that we live in a different world and safety has a, um, a different meaning. And, of course, all kind of technologies can be used on a good way and can be used on a bad way. This is invented by a student. And he put the files for the gun on the internet. So it was downloaded 100,000 times in a few hours before the government shut down his, uh, his website. Um, of course, I think that's the same with the internet. There's not yet a sort of official rules or police. And it will be the same with 3D printing. Of course, there will be new dangers where we have to be aware. I'm not so interested in uh, guns, but I'm interested just in um, the way that this is a big puzzle that is connected together. So I made, um, on that level, my own big puzzle. Um, I did an exhibition in um, a Roman museum. And I was really impressed by the Roman faces. And um, of course, I'm um, uh, a child of my time. I really love science fiction and those kind of Hollywood movies. So I'm a big fan of uh, Transmo Transformer and, and robots. So I made um, the combination. I was not interested in the face, or I was not interested in the Transformer but in the transformation between face and uh, robot. If I would print this piece in one piece, what would be possible with a 3D printer, I would never be able to paint it. So by painting first all the different parts and glue then everything together, I'm able to make this kind of pieces. Of course, you can easily see the, the starting point of the face. Uh, on the feet, it's also still possible. Here, you still have more the silhouette of the face. And it's really um, dangerous. I think um, there's no picture that is showing a sculpture on a good way. A sculpture is something you have to see on a physical level, to feel on a physical level. This looks really like a block. But if you see it in reality, your eye is really floating through the sculpture. It's, a, ever, it's actually a very light sculpture with all floating parts. But it's impossible to, to show it on um, a good picture combination of um, a helmet and an 18th century castle. My sculptures, 
uh, in uh, the Roman uh, Museum. Uh, it's a sort of god statues. I was inspired on um, uh, like uh, the Viking helmet and um, um, elements of um, uh, yeah the, the vases and uh, skulls and elements of the Romans, the Greeks, the Vikings, and made sort of new sculptures. Of course, you see really the difference if I'm speaking about um, the holes inside the sculptures. These kind of sculptures at that time, they didn't have it because it was actually an idea. They were not thinking about it or they didn't have the technical skills or Hercules that can be an inspiration to have a sort of new uh, Roman statue. Um, it's a statue uh, around um, eight meter high. It's uh, inspired on the, the Jupiter pillar that was there in the, the past. And of course, here you have elements of the Roman vases. Uh, you have different kind of mask of the Romans. You have the, the contour lines of the bear mask of Hercules, the haircuts of the Romans, but it's everything putting in your own sauce. I really love to, to use history and to really um, recombine history and, and make them uh, to your own story. Um, and the top of this sculpture was the inspiration of the front of this sculpture. This is um, a model of um, 42 centimeter um, 3D printed, and this is then actually the physical piece of 4 meter 20 high, but completely made uh, manually. Of course, um, uh, the bottom part is with CNC, and then uh, made a, a mold and a fiberglass cast, and the bottom is, of course, uh, completely done manually. There will be probably um, a future where you will be able to print your nature or things like that. There are some really cool YouTube movies. Um, uh, one um, student from England has invented um, a glass printer. And it's working on uh, solar energy and on sand. So you can find a movie on the internet where he just uh, is in the Sahara Desert putting his machine taking his laptop, putting his file, and the machine starts to eat um, sand from uh, the desert. And with a magnified glass and solar energy, it's actually a printer to print glass. Um, they have like invented the garden of the future. It's like a sort of 3D printer, but there's no plastic in it. There are just um, seeds of plants and water. And you can say, OK, in those square meter, I want uh, tomatoes, I want carrots, I want this. And of course, we know how nature is working. So we know that a tomato needs this kind of area to uh, live, needs um, this kind of amount of water. So it's actually that kind of printer that will um, keep maintenance of that little garden and will uh, get like the maximum out of uh, plants that you can grow on this little space. Um, so it's really uh, very interesting how, um, how uh, technology is uh, evolving. Um, I met a professor at the University of uh, Wageningen in the Netherlands, and he has the patent on the strawberry. So I was really thinking, yeah, how can you have a patent on that? Eh? But he invented a strawberry that is a little bit more red, so we think it's better, and a strawberry that grows better. So, of course, that's what we know as a commercial strawberry. And I was really interested um, in this kind of stories. They are inventing apples with university that will be red inside and the hope children find it again uh, attractive. Um, you will have um, onions on the market, so you don't have to cry anymore if you cut them. But we're actually animals. Eh? A human is actually an animal and we want to have control of our environment, control of our life. So if you put like a square bucket around the melon, the melon can only grow square. So it's better for a commercial use to to stock it, it takes um, less place and it's um, much easier to stock something square than to stock something that is a bowl. And for the human consumer, if you have to cut it because it's square, it doesn't roll away anymore. So manipulation can be on very different levels. I love, of course, uh, craftsmanship. So I was really inspired on like the 18th century vases of, um, of a mason, this kind of porcelain vases. Of course, then if I did my homework, you, you see that they are like working sometimes six months on one vase. And I made a sort of combination of a sort of mutated strawberries. It's of course um, uh, talking about uh, what is genetic manipulation, how will um, the future look, how will uh, the plants look like, but much more from a sort of um, beautiful surrealistic level. This is also via the flower arrangements of uh, Ikebana. 
Also, this one has, of course, um, the two ways. Um, the vase is not any more static. It's almost like um, the candelier escaping from um, the Disney movies. Um, but at the same time, it has something scary. It's a little bit like a monster, but because of the, the nice yellow colors, it's, of course, um, less monstrous. Um, the first picture in the world, 1826, actually not that long ago. Um, and I was really interested in um, history. I think every piece of my work has, of course, its own story. And I have made um, a new work that is a sort of um, homage and Muybridge, really one of the first photographers that could prove that a horse is actually floating for a few seconds. Before that, everybody was thinking that a horse was always with one feet on the ground. So photography gave the ability to, to prove this kind of um, uh, scientist uh, things. And I made a sort of sculpture that you have the feeling of uh, movement. It are actually sculptures that I let um, dance in the computer, I let them uh, move in the computer. And it's almost like um, if in the past you were shaking with a camera along the highway, you get like those crazy lines. Um, I don't know how you really translate it, but it's um, the long phone time you have from a camera and I'm using that, but there's no physical camera, there's no physical photography, it's all done in a computer, it's all um, created. I made around 9,000 of those kind of pictures because of course, 50% um, I can predict and 50% is just a coincidence of what happens with the animation. And then I selected like around nine um, pictures I, I really developed as a physical uh, art piece. And of course the challenge is how can you translate something like that in a physical piece? It's impossible to, to have this movement in a physical piece. Um, we have different laws in a physical piece than that we can have in this two-dimensional imagination. And this is actually my solution where you really feel the movement, of course, in time on different physical levels. And I'm really happy about that piece because I really love this kind of um, almost uh, baroque uh, complexity. Um, from other sides, it's a really different uh, sculpture and a different feeling. Um, this is one of the first um, sculptures, I think actually maybe one, or maybe the first one in the world that is printed on um, a full color uh, printer. I don't mean like the Z-Core printers, but um, Stratasys invented um, the G75. It's not a printer anymore with like the two cartridges, like uh, the model and uh, the mole I was talking about, but it's actually a printer that is already adapted for eight cartridges. Um, for the moment, it's only using uh, five, and you have um, uh, the mole, you have uh, red, uh, yellow, blue, and transparency. That means that you can really invent every sculpture with all different kind of colors, and you can print transparent sculptures with um, uh, color inside. Of new technology that, that still has to develop, but in the future it will really be possible to really put like your texture over your sculpture and to, to put almost like a tattoo over your sculpture and take something much more crazy than that you will be able to really paint on a manual level. So product design, um, architecture, uh, sculpture, uh, everything that we know will really change by this kind of technology. Um, the problem is today it's eight times that expensive as just um, is less printing, so very expensive. And the maximum size they can make it is like 50 centimeter. But of course it's, it's the first step to, um, to a next world. These are um, sculptures printed by uh, the Obiet 500. It's uh, the previous machine that could only print with uh, three different colors. Um, and this is, for example, impossible in glass. In glass you can never do um, symmetry. You can never have control, and those lines are not painted, but they are really inside the sculpture and jumping over each other. Um, I was really inspired on like um, the um, the way that computer chips are designed, or um, like uh, science fiction movies like like Tron uh, are really an inspiration for this kind of sculptures. And of course, Brettomer, you really have the feeling of almost like paint that is um, put inside the glass, but it's all drawn by the computer. It's all printed by a machine. Um, the moment that it's printed, it's actually a little bit like a milk glass. You cannot look through it. So to have it really like glass, you have again to polish it and to varnish it. And of course, then again, you have the limitations of where your hand can reach 
or your tool can reach. So things are, of course, developing, but um, um, a lot is, is still manual labor. This is a sculpture. It's not polished. It would be impossible. But of course, it's, it's very beautiful. What I didn't, uh, what is just a coincidence, I didn't realize that there's a really little bit uh, blue inside the transparency. So how sculpture was, you got more blue. How thinner the sculpture was, you get more transparency. It was really fantastic poetry, but it's something that is just a coincidence. I didn't thought about it. Uh, also, the engineers didn't knew that. Um, and that is, of course, uh, changing. What is also really beautiful, in the beginning, I really had to convince companies to, to collaborate, to work together, um, while now really big companies like uh, Stratasys are, are contacting me to, to start to collaborate with them. And of course, it's a win-win situation because um, I can really be that um, badass artist that putting like, uh, those difficult questions to the engineers that have to put like, uh, the next step. And of course, the moment that they show that they have a new machine, they can use my material to show what is possible with that machine. And that's really a nice uh, way how companies and artists can uh, work together. So this is really like um, a short introduction to my work. Um, I don't know if there are uh, questions from you. had the opportunity to go to um, Pittsburgh to see the, car in the, the work in the Carnegie Museum. Mm -hmm. And I was walking through the museum and I got to see some really wonderful ancient sculptures, including Henry Moore mm -hmm. um, and Barbara Hepworth and, and such. And then I came to the 80s, 1980s, and I saw the sculptures by wonder wonderful uh, contemporary you know, artists um, that were making work in the 80s. And their work, um, had uh, an old look to it. It was starting mm. to fall apart, and it was it was discoloring and changing. And you know, I thought how nice it was to see a lot of this ancient old work mm. um, that still had a great presence to it. But then this work from the '80s had a short life. And my concern with some of the poly resin um, sculptures, and especially the clear, is that they might yellow. And as an artist working in that same material, mm. I have a lot of concern that my work will only have a short life to it, mm -hmm. like the work from the 80s that had all that synthetic material. So I was wondering what your thoughts are, or is there any ways that we can overcome that? Um, I, I think we have to do our homework. Um, like I know a lot of um, artists, they, they printed uh, pieces in SLS, they sold it directly from the machine, and two years later they get it back from their client that is complaining that it's uh, changing of color. Of course, if you print in plastic, plastic is not UV protected. So that's one of the reasons that all my sculptures are painted. So they are UV protected, so I don't have this kind of uh, problems. Of course, you know there's a difference if you have a sculpture in metal or bronze or plastic. Um, of course, some of my sculptures are impossible in bronze. Other ones would be perfectly possible, but then the client have to be aware to pay a different amount for it. So, of course, my goal is also to, to work in more um, uh, durable materials, like, like maybe um, making sculptures in silver, metal, bronze. Um, today, I'm, most of my pieces are, are still in, um, in plastic. They are very protected, they are UV protected, but of course, it's a new technology. And I think that's the same, like um, Picasso has uh, sculptures in plaster, he has sculptures in bronze, but he has even uh, maquettes in um, just cardboard and paper they have to be protected. And I think that's, of course, the very difference with um, contemporary art, that a lot of artists are not thinking about um, uh, durability, or um, there is more maintenance to contemporary art than sometimes the, the old masters. Um, of course, if you would look to, to maybe the really um, um, first uh, plaster molds of um, Henry Moore or things like that, probably there is also already a lot of restoration to that. Um, so I think it's important to do your own homework. Um, I work together with companies to do really research about uh, the paint I'm using outside. So I did really um, for years scientific research to find what is the best paint and what is like um, um, the conditions that it will be in the, the future. I had one commission to do like a print of 2,500 square meter on a transparent folly. 
but we cancelled the whole commission because I found no company in the world that wanted to give a guarantee on it. And of course, that's sometimes very difficult if you work with new materials. You don't always know what will be the big future of it. And I think you have just to be um, honest to your client about that. Um, I think if you're lying, it's of course a, a big mistake. Um, what is also interesting is it's a new technology that asks for um, a new way of thinking. For example, um, let's say a collector has um, a plaster piece of Henry Moore. His house burns down. He lost his sculpture. Probably it's insured, but he lost it. It's never replaceable. Um, my idea is, if I will pass away, that there is a foundation that has, for example, my, my hard drive. And if a client can prove he has um, the ownership of that sculpture and it lost in a fire or whatever, it can be reprinted. So it's a different kind of um, thinking. It's the same with like the big um, outside print of 2,000 square meter. There's no UV protected um, two-dimensional print yet. So it will exist for 10 years. And I have been honest with that client. And after 10 years, the client has uh, the possibility to remove the work or to reprint it just at production costs. So he buys from me as sort of the copyright of that file. So that's how I, as an artist, thinking about that and dealing with that. Yeah. Some more questions? Don't be scared. Yes. Um, I worked a little bit with um, um, CNC cutting on um, the, the polyurethane foam. Um, I did also a few pieces in, um, in, in wood uh, where I made an, um, a plaster mold on it. But of course you have like the three axe, the five axe uh, machine, but they are very limited. Um, so I love to, to um, go beyond those limitations. And for me it's sometimes a lot cheaper to do it just on a manual way than working with this kind of um, CNC machine. I don't have so much experience with it. Um, I did visit um, a company that was working for um, Anish Kapoor or um, big artists like uh, Mark Quinn. And it was also a big um, uh, dissolution because like, you think like an edge is still made by the artist, but it's actually all made by robots. Or I think it's a different that my generation is saying that we are using 3D printing or we're using this kind of new technology. But um, a lot of the, the older generation, they are saying that it's all done manually because that sells better as a sort of romantic idea of the artist than saying that it's all done by machine. So of course today, if you have uh, the money, you can do a lot with uh, computers and robots and it's, it's evolving. Um, um, an artist uh, designer like uh, Joris Larman is actually um, how going to build one of the first bridges made by a robot arm. So there are really done a lot of experiments, but of course today it's much um, more expensive than, than do it uh, the old school way.